Hello Booktube! I want to give you a video here as a sort of a memorial marker to a tragedy that took place yesterday. <laughs> where, or is it yesterday? Time moves differently in rural Vermont. I want to, I want to stress to you that on Wednesday I made a, co a Wednesday comic book video and it was full of sexy quips and uh, it was a, there was a technical malfunction and, and it couldn't be saved. The footage couldn't be recovered or transferred at all. So. Uh, and I didn't feel like doing it again with a different piece of technology. It seemed like just the moment had gone. I'm a bit of a diva. Uh, so I didn't do it. I just didn't do a comic video on that day. And I thought, okay, well, maybe do some sort of catch up on the weekend or maybe just wait until next week. But I got a little kick in the pants from fate itself today. Because as I mentioned in that last video, I, we went out and about. We went to these places. You have to see these buildings to believe them. You would look at them from the road and you would not believe there were books in them at all, and much less a wonderland of books. And if I wasn't prepared for the books that I was going to find, then in one of the places I went to, and you can imagine how unprepared I was for an, a wall of old comic books. Each one of them wrapped in plastic, each one of them a dollar. And from all different eras, mostly the 1980s, which was a golden era for comic books. And I saw those and thought, Oh my, wouldn't that be fun to just sort of pick through issue by issue if only we had the time and I didn't have, you know, a mark right there. And then my eye caught a 1980s issue of the Legion of Superheroes and I thought, I've got plenty of time and screw him. <laughs> so then I, I dug into these, these racks of comic books and I found a stack of Legion comic books. And I wanted to show them to you because, you know, <laughs> captive audience, that whole thing. It, it's not new comics because, of course... There is no current ongoing comic book starring the Legion of Superheroes, nor are they a guest star anywhere, nor are any of their characters guest stars anywhere. That's DC for you today. But once upon a time, the Legion, ha the Legion has an incredibly long, populous fan base, 50 years old, tons and tons of fan lore, more so probably than any other DC property, certainly more so than any DC property that currently has a comic of its own. It's a crime. That there's no Legion comic, but we have a, a, a Harley Quinn has her own monthly series. I, but anyway, I I found a stack of Legion comics. I could easily have gotten three times this many. There were that many Legion issues there, and I wanted to show you some of them. Uh, the, the the started out with uh, just ordinary Legion comics from the from the 1980s. The, those of you who are maybe not quite up to speed, uh, the the Legion of Superheroes is a, is a gigantic, sprawling team, sometimes over 30 members, of superpowered teenagers a thousand years in the future, when the, the galaxy is mostly civilized, mostly peaceful. Earth is a paradise. Uh, most of the, the member planets in the United Federation of Planets are, are paradises. But there is still smuggling and crime and planetary disasters of one kind or another. And at one point, three teenagers are enlisted by the world's richest man, R.J. Brand, to form the kind of superhero team that used to exist a thousand years ago and that Brand remembers from history. Teams like the Teen Titans or the Justice League. They are the inspiration for this new 30th century team of teenagers. He brings them together, he trains them, he gives them a clubhouse, he gives them uniforms, and he gives them a name, the Legion of Superheroes. And at first it's only three fascinating to remember, those of you who care about your comic book trivia, that uh, the, the original trio that, that founds the Legion of Superheroes does not contain an Earth person. They're all three aliens. Uh, you get Earth members later on, including right away, but the first, that first trio are all aliens, and that's the only time that that's ever happened with a team that's, that's like this. Certainly it's the only time that it happened 50 years ago. Uh, and these first, these these three issues are the only three. There were so many that I could have got. These were three from that basic era, the ongoing stories of the Legion of Superheroes, with our team just fighting one supervillain or a catastrophe after another. This this issue in particular, I had this when it first came out. This was seventy five cents. These were all in the eighties, uh, and this was. Uh, I will I'll try and get the cover artwork up close here. But this has got fantastic artwork by Terry Shoemaker who basically left the industry, but the artwork here is the reason that I got it. In, in addition to the cover story, uh, you need a little quick tutorial. The cover says, mon has gone mad and no one is safe. And the, the blue-caped young man who is punching the giant on the cover is mon who is 
the most powerful member of the Legion of Superheroes. He's from the planet Daxam, which has the same gravity density and yellow sun vulnerability as Krypton. So he has Kryptonian level superpowers, only there's no kryptonite. <laughs> so he, Daxamites are vulnerable to the lead content in the atmosphere of planets that have that, and it's just as legal to them as, Krypton, as kryptonite. But one of the members of the Legion of Superheroes develops a serum that frees Monel from that vulnerability and therefore makes him the most powerful super being in the galaxy. Uh, and the, in this issue, he briefly loses his mind and fights a small number of Legionnaires. And the key, the reason that it, that it sticks in my mind, the reason that I'm dwelling on it, is because the key with the Legion for a long time has always been actually the same key as the key with the Justice League. You judge how effective a big marquee-level team like that is by how well they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, in the Justice League's case, rogue Kryptonians, or in the Legion's case, rogue Daxamites. If it's a good team, you'll have a number of people who can hold their own against one of those people. And this issue is the, the, it's just the luck of the draw who mon -El fights. I, I myself believe that the Legion is composed of a number of people who can handle a Daxamite rather easily, but uh, not physically. There's only two Legion members who can handle one physically, but there are plenty of other ways to take down a being that powerful. But these, I got these issues as sort of a walk down memory lane. I love these old issues, but uh, a lot of these things have been reprinted. The Legion is, DC Archive Editions is currently doing just, they're just inching forward, reprinting all of the Legion in all of its areas, just in straight chronological order. Hasn't been a Legion Archive volume in a long time. They might actually have stopped. Uh, and there have been hardly any Legion reprints this last summer. There were two that were fantastic, but the, you don't get as many as I would like, certainly. And none of the chronological reprint series have moved up to this era, anything like it. And the, this era ended. The artwork started becoming spotty. The editors stopped being interested. It went from two titles to one. And then the Legion ended. And uh, a writer and artist named Keith Giffen, those of you who know, who know comic books will know who he is. He, was, he is, among other things, the creator of Ambush Bug. <laughs> uh, he went to the powers that be at DC and uh, to Todd and Mary Beerbohm and said, I have an idea for the Legion. Let's reboot it five years later than the continuity that fans have known. So the continuity that fans knew was a sunlit version of the 30th century, a happy team of teenagers fighting crime and natural disaster, all of which was an exception to the rule of a largely sunny future. Keith Giffen wanted to envision a future five years after that in which the galaxy has gone to hell and in which the Legion members are older and scattered to the four winds. There is no team and there hasn't been in years. And a lot of them are bitter. And a lot of them are, are maimed or uh, t totally uh, disillusioned with the ideals of the former, you know, the, the pie in the sky naive Legion of Superheroes. And they let him do it. So all of a sudden, uh, the Legion of Superheroes that was coming out every month was totally new. And he not only wrote it, but he did some of his best sequential artwork for it. And he did the artwork in classic Watchmen style of nine little panels on each page, usually with only exceptions being made only for big moments. But it, it's incredible, incredible work. Those of you who are Legion fans, I don't imagine there are any, but Legion fans know this time period. It's the five years later time period. And they love it. And it has never been reprinted at all. Not as part of that ongoing Legion archive and not as an individual trade paperback on its own. DC has just left it alone completely. They've never revisited it, they've never continued it, and they've never reprinted it. So if you want to reread the Five Years Later saga, you have to buy the individual issues. And when I was at this place in the middle of nowhere in small town Vermont, I found a stack of the Five Year Later issues, starting with number two. That on the cover is a, a headless, weird, malevolent android fighting someone that if, you, if you're a Legion fan, you have to study that cover before you figure out that that's Ultra Boy on the cover. He's not wearing a uniform, but on his arm he has a tattoo that is the symbol that was on his, his superhero costume in bygone days when he wore one. Nobody here, there's no such thing in these, in these great, great issues as colorful four-square superhero comic costumes. There's no such thing as people saying long live the Legion or, or flying off in formation over 30th century metropolis. There's no such thing as any of that. The Legion members are scattered to the winds, they have scruff, they have ponytails, and they have bad attitudes. They are all adults now. And uh, when I first learned, this is number two, I searched today 
for issue number one, and I did not find it. I still think, part of me still thinks it's there somewhere. These were in a jumble. I would have needed a long time. <laughs> I would have needed longer, even than I was willing to impose, to find everything. I feel certain that the first issue is there. But, one way or another, I found it starting with issue number two. And I remember when these first came out, I, I was 28 years old, and I was vigorously interested in the Legion, as I still am. And I worried when the first issue appeared. I, I thought, okay, well, I don't know the fates of any of my old favorite characters, but more importantly, I miss the sunlit universe. I miss the optimism it, that is now gone. Obviously, the point of this was that it's gone. I was willing to give it a, a, a try because the writing and the artwork was better than anything I'd even imagined from coming from Keith Giffen. Uh, and it just kept being that way. Issue after issue after issue. One after another after another. Of all of these, this original run, I found the, almost the whole of the original run of the five-year latest saga just going on and on and on. This, this is the, where is it? This is the issue that famously is told in, largely in prose. Uh, with, with just accompanying illustrations. We and we learn everything here. We learn the fates of all the Marquis Legion characters. We get introduced to new characters, uh, including a character named Andromeda, Laurel Gann, who is from Daxin. She, so she has Kryptonian-level superpowers. And you might think, well, those of you who maybe have a passing familiarity with the Legion of Superheroes might think, well, why would you need to introduce a, a blonde Kryptonian level superpowered character to the Legion, don't they have Supergirl? And they don't. These took place at a time after the uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths when Supergirl had been killed. So she's been killed, she's not part of the Legion anymore, and sooner, pretty soon, she was not only killed, but retconned right out of continuity, so there wasn't any Supergirl. And Keith Giffen had to come up with a Supergirl stand in. He didn't want to lose that, so sure enough. And of course, there's no Superboy either, because the aftermath of uh, of Crisis on Infinite Earths was that, uh, and was and John Byrne's relaunch of the character Superman was that Clark Kent was never a costumed superhero as a, as a teenager. He puts on a costume for the first time as an adult, and oh, I remember when I saw that that was the, his six part Man of Steel miniseries where John Byrne was given almost complete reign to remake Superman almost. Only a couple of the suggestions that he made to the, the powers that be at DC were turned down. For instance, he proposed that uh, Lex Luthor was Cal el of Krypton's brother, and that two brothers were sent to Earth, one good, one evil. And he also proposed that they weren't sent to Earth alone, <laughs> that, they, that the brothers were sent to Earth with their mother, <laughs> Lara, and that she's just around as a 40-something superpowered woman on Earth. And the DC character said, no, no, what we want here is for him to be the only survivor of the planet Krypton. So get rid of the brother and get rid of the mother. <laughs> so, so, and he didn't get that, but he got everything else. He got a much less powerful Superman. He got uh, Lex Luthor, who doesn't wear spectacular science fiction armor. He's just an evil businessman. And he also got no Superboy. No Superboy, no Superdog, no nothing like that. Superman puts on a costume for the first time as an adult. And when I saw that in the first issue of Man of Steel, my very first thought was not, oh, John Byrne's really popular. And my very first thought was not, boy, Man of Steel number one is probably going to be very pop, very uh, valuable in 20 years. It wasn't anything like that. My first thought was, well, but, but what about the Legion? Because <laughs> Superboy was a fundamental part of inspiring the Legion of Superheroes. If you don't have a Superboy, then you have retconned the Legion out of continuity, and that turned out to be true. All sorts of things needed to happen and be rejiggered all over. And I don't. I lost track over the, lag, the following 35 years. I lost track of where the Legion ended up. So I don't know right now if, there, if DC even thinks there is a Legion in the 30th century. I don't understand it. It is absolutely perfect for the live screen. It's absolutely perfect for a launch. It's a team of teenage superheroes, which was defined for most of its time period by who was dating who. That is evergreen. <laughs> but, but one way or another, when I first got saw the first issue of this and thought, okay, this is incredibly impressive work, but I'm not sure I'm going to like this. Uh, and then I just loved it. You, you get By the time you're at issue number three, you're, you're hooked completely. These are the, some of the best run on the Legion that's ever been done. And if, they, if I could feel that, I was as traditionalist a Legion fan as you could get, than anybody could. And p fans loved it. It went on for 50 issues, 50, 60 issues, something like that. Giffen didn't stay on as artist 
the whole time, and sometimes the art got really bad. <laughs> uh, but the the storylines were all in the you know this this adult version of of what we knew as the Legion universe, which means that every time a character was reintroduced, either a good guy or a bad guy, you had no idea what you were getting. It was familiar yet different, and it worked absolutely worked. And I was overjoyed to find these things because this is the only way that you can experience them. This is the only way that you can reread them, is just to prowl through these old issues. So to find a stack of them for a dollar a piece, I'm not even out any money. I can read these things until they fall apart the way that my original issues did. Uh, so that, that's what I wanted to share with you today. It's just, it's a comic book update. It's not quite new comics. I wish that I could hold up a new Legion of Superheroes comics. Instead, these are from the 1980s, an era before most of you were born when everything in the world made sense. Uh, and I want, I want to just wrap it up that way. This is, this is comics for the week. I don't think I'll return to comic books. I, there's no need to talk about the two issues that I, that I lost a video on. There were just two more chapters in the Drowned Earth saga that we've been talking about for several Wednesdays. Really good chapters. I'll, I will synopsize them when I do next. I'm sure that Drowned Earth wraps up next week. So next Wednesday, uh, if I'm not still here. I, I will uh, I will gladly wrap that up with the final issues of Drowned Earth. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll just uh, this is this is me and the beans signing off. We are both having oh we're both having a blast up here in the wintry wonderland. <laughs> uh, I took her out uh, last night, and, and it was weird because it's pitch dark, except that it was bright enough to read by because of the moon and the stars. I had completely forgotten living on at, at Hyde Cottage that there are such things as stars. There were billions of them in the sky overhead, and the moon on the fallen snow was easily enough to read by. And we're, we were walking around. It was, uh, I think, 175 degrees below zero. And we, when she, once she did her filthy, sinful business, we came back inside for the night. And when we went out first thing in the morning, fresh sunlight everywhere, there were tons of tracks all over the snow, all kinds of critters that had come to visit during the night, and she was all over that. This was this has been an experience for Frida that she's very much liking. Uh, so that's it. I'm gonna I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wool gather too much. I'm gonna wrap up. I will try to keep making videos even while I'm here. <laughs> and if I succeed, it won't be five a day, but it, well, I'll hope, I, I miss seeing your faces when I don't, so I'll, I will try to do that, and then if I if I ever do return to Hyde Park Ave, well, I'll go back to my usual schedule. <laughs> uh, but that's a mighty big if. <laughs> so it's, it's homemade clam chowder tonight, <laughs> so I may not leave. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I will see you all uh, tomorrow. I don't think I'll make any more videos tonight, but tomorrow. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, too.